to the very first episode of the Dreadful Night Podcast. My name is Charlotte, and I've always been obsessed with any stories about things that go bump in the night. And I figured, why not try to start a podcast where I go in-depth with these stories and try to find out the truth behind them. Tonight, we'll be talking about the Salem Witch Trials. So, what are the Salem Witch Trials? Well, they were a series of hearings and persecutions of people accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts, starting around February of 1692. Now, they continued until May of 1693, and over this period of time, more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft. 30 total were found guilty, and of those 30, 19 were executed by hanging, 5 died in jail, and one man, Giles Corey, was pressed to death for never pleading guilty to witchcraft. Now, during all of my research into the Salem Witch Trials, I started to notice a lot of similarities and a lot of connections between the accused and the accusers themselves. It seemed like there was something maybe greater going on behind the scenes, that there was something else happening that could be suspicious, that could be underlying in the the grand scheme of things. So I started to dig deeper. In looking through all of the notes and all the reports and all of the people involved with the Salem Witch Trials, two of the major players inside of the Salem Witch Trials were Samuel Parris and Thomas Putnam. And in this podcast, we're going to go over how we believe the Salem Witch Trials actually started, why they started, and just what was the reason behind them continuing in the first place. Tonight, I'm also joined by my very special guest, Sugary. Sugary, hello, how are you? Hello, I'm good. So, Sugary, what do you think of when you're thinking of the Salem Witch Trials and you're thinking of Thomas Putnam, Samuel Paris, um, Betty Paris, any of these people that are involved in there? What what kind of pops into your head? I think that it seems more than coincidental how close the first accusers were. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then looking into it, so the first of the accusers were Betty Paris, who she was the daughter of Samuel Paris, um, her cousin that lived with them, Abigail Williams, and the third was Ann Putnam Jr., and she's the daughter of Thomas Putnam. Now, these first three girls, they started having these fits, so they started by um, contorting, they were shouting, they were seeing chanting, they would have cuts and bruises, they were very forgetful, just very out of the norm behavior for these girls. And initially, when when all these fits were going on, um, they kind of were confused. They didn't know what what exactly was happening. It wasn't immediately, oh, it's witches, you know? And they ended up taking the girls to go see this doctor. This doctor was named William Griggs. Now, William Griggs did an assessment on all of these girls and said that there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. There's nothing that could be ailing them. And he professed that he thought it was some form of bewitchment, that there could be witches in the town and that these girls could, in fact, be uh, victims of a bewitchment. And from there, the girls were pressured by the town magistrates after, you know, the, the doctor comes out and he says, okay, there's, there's witches going around. This is bewitchment. The magistrates come in and they say, where are these witches at? You know, we got to get the witches out of the town because, you know, they're going to mess up everything. They're, they're coming into Salem, the devil's in Salem. So from there, the three girls, they go and they accuse Tichuba, who was the Paris family's servant. Um, They also accused Sarah Good, and they also accused Sarah Osborne. Now, Sarah Osborne was a elderly woman. She was a widow. She wasn't really a member of the church, um, and she had a few disagreements with a couple of her neighbors. Um, She was one of the ones accused. She, while she was being questioned um, for witchcraft, she never admitted that she was a witch. She always pled not guilty. She always said that she was never in league with the devil, um, and that just in general, she was innocent of of this crime. Sarah Good was a homeless and penniless beggar. She was also often seen mumbling to herself, um, and she just generally wasn't 
people of she just wasn't somebody that the people of the the village of Salem really like looked upon as as a higher or a upstanding citizen. Um, now, initially, when she was arrested and questioned, she vehemently denied any involvement of of being a witch. And it wasn't until uh, later on that she finally confessed to being a witch. Um, but both her and Sarah Osborne were both hanged at the at the gallows. Now, Tituba, on the other hand, out of the three original accused, Tituba is the only one to have, right off the bat, um, confessed to being a witch. Now, she stated that at one point she had a vision or a dream that this devil man came to her and had her sign um, the book in which that would uh, have her join the League of Witches and that there were other witches in the town of Salem. Now, she also implicated Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne for claiming that, yes, they were also witches. Now, it gets a little suspicious when Tituba is the only one to right off the bat confess, but it's also in some accounts uh, reported that Paris actually beat Tituba um, until she confessed, like beat her to get a confession out of her. Um, so it's it's very unclear as to why exactly Tichiba confessed, um, but she is the only one to have confessed to being a witch, and she did not, uh, she, she was not executed for it. She stayed the remainder of the time of the Salem Witch Trials in jail and was actually eventually uh, released. Um, I think Sugar, one of the questions think? for me is did parents beat her into a confession saying, mm -hmm that you have to confess mm -hmm. because I don't want my daughter to be branded a liar. Like, so mm -hmm. was she under, did she know if I confess, nothing will happen to me. I'm mm -hmm. doing it for this reason. Mm -hmm. Or did he just beat a confession out of her? And mm -hmm. that was his reason, but it wasn't, I know, which is a little minuscule thing, but I wonder about things like that. Yeah, and I totally agree with you there. It's very, it's it's just very suspicious as to why she would be beaten into confession, but not the other women. It was like specifically her. And then on top of that as well, it says that when she was released from prison, she was actually bailed out by an anonymous person. Um, uh huh. Anonymous. Anonymous person. Yeah. Um. But it says that she was built out by an anonymous person. So, is did she confess to just you know contribute to this story that there were witches about? And does that Knowing lead back that into she the girls? Wouldn't come to any harm. Exactly. Yeah. And does that That's... lead back to the girls though? That's my question. How does that? How does that correlate back to the three? Well, original see, I, d I honestly didn't find any fault with the girls at first. Uh huh. Because whether we whether we write it off as um, children misbehaving, mm -hmm. like um, now they would be in a school for unruly kids or some, do you know what I mean? Like just mm -hmm. j kids being bad, right? Like right. if they were just being bad, I, because I it's really hard for me to believe that they can just be that belligerently evil. Yeah. So I don't think that it started out as that. I think that mm -hmm. either they were under some kind of medical ailment, whether it was um, epilepsy or something of the like, mm -hmm. along with childish pranks. Mm -hmm. Then once it got so far, they couldn't pull it back. So they had to keep embellishing. Whether mm -hmm. they did that for the attention they got, oh, oh, this poor child. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or whether they did it to save face, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, and that's one thing that you can look at as well is, it's with Paris, right? With him, with him beating Tichuba into a confession. You know, is it because of the fact that he wanted to protect his daughter or her um, her credibility? Did he want to protect his daughter's credibility because that's the minister's daughter? Yeah, you know? I I and, do think that's what it was. Yeah, and 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 on top of that as well, like looking into it and thinking about it, right? Like the girls didn't proclaim that this was bewitchment until they went to William Griggs, the doctor, and he said, there's nothing wrong with you. 
right? Like, it, even in some reports, it even states, like, they were, like, trying to figure out if they were epileptic or not, and they couldn't find anything. So it seems that, in all honesty, like, because he's a Puritan, like, obviously they think that, you know, the devil's around, and it's, it's they're very much, um, you know, in the church, and, and, and a very much religious standpoint on most of their, their world circumstances, they might have thought, okay, yeah, the the doctor might have thought, well, there's nothing wrong with you, so it's got to be the devil. Like, it's got to be, you got to be bewitched. It's yep, got to be no the devil. No other explanation. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, the girls, like, it could have just been the girls acting out. It could have been the girls being very unruly. Definitely. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, they kept it up because they were probably getting attention, like, oh, my God, like, what is wrong with these girls? And then all of a sudden you know they're they're getting all this attention it keeps building it keeps building and then finally you know it gets to the point where they have to go to the doctor and the doctor's like it's bewitchment and then the magistrates come in and you know you got these you know big top magistrates coming in like okay who's the witches and they're probably freaked out and so then they just immediately are like oh it's these three people you know um but begs so that begs the question mm -hmm. is um if anyone quote unquote suggested those three people to the girls kind of yeah. leading them in that direction yeah and that's one thing um that had me kind of like questioning questioning why those women right like why was it these these particular these particular three women so looking into it tituba of course was the servant so she had been the servant of paris for at least a decade at this point like she had been with him since at least the 80 since 1680s sorry um 1680s maybe even as early as like the 1670s she had been with him for a very long time um, so I could see as to, and, and, you know, she's like somebody easy to accuse, like, oh, it's the servant, you know, and it, it was even said that Tichuba would tell like stories of like fortune telling and stuff like she would like teach little Betty how to do like fortune telling and they would do it for um, like just to see like, oh, who's my husband going to be, you know, like little child games type thing. Um, I could see why Sarah Good was accused because she was homeless, she was penniless, she was like muttering to herself. So how much of a credible person is she? Like she's yeah. one of the easy ones like oh it's, you know, it's her, you know, she, the crazy lady that lives on the street, you know, it's it's that, that nobody woman. cares about. Exactly. And then Sarah Osborne was the most like difficult one to pinpoint until I stumbled across two different articles that detailed Sarah Osborne. One of them said that Sarah Osborne was actually a neighbor of the Putnams. The other article said that Sarah Osborne, when her husband died, he left her like a decent inheritance. They owned like this, I can't remember how many acres it was, but it was a big farm. They owned a big, big farm. Um, and when her husband died, he left the inheritance to Sarah. However, when his two sons came of age, they were supposed to inherit the property from her. So essentially, like, she was, like, the trustee of it until they got to the age, and then she was supposed to share it with them or just give it all to them. And looking into it, if she's a friend or if she's a neighbor of the Putnams, right, and she owns all of this land, and she's the one in charge of it, and the only ones that can take this land from her are the sons and she's like battling back and forth with these sons um for the inheritance right because they had by this time they had come of age so she's like battling back and forth with the sons for the inheritance of all of this land and stuff she gets named you know why i think because the putnam's wanted that land and the sons were probably more than likely willing to sell it. Which gives even more credibility to the three women that were quote unquote suggested because mm -hmm. they would be the most believable, especially with Tichuba's um voodoo background. Mm -hmm. And um it wouldn't seem as suspect mm -hmm. with him suggesting somebody that he could get something out of. Mm-hmm. 
And I think though, like, and, and just just looking into it, I, one thing I forgot to mention about Sarah Good. So Sarah Good, aside from being homeless and painless and all this other stuff, um, she actually, when she was accused, she was pregnant. Now she's got like probably the saddest story I think out of anybody that was accused. When she was accused, she was pregnant. She gave birth in prison, and the baby died like very shortly after. Like she basically gave birth, baby died, and then her four and a half year old daughter. Now in reports, her name is written as Dorcas. Um, but it was later said that her, her name was actually like Dorothy, but, um, I guess they had wrote it wrong or maybe it was like a nickname or something, but it was said that Sarah Good had a four and a half year old daughter and that this four and a half year old daughter, daughter claimed that her mother had a, like a snake and the snake bit her. Um, and then like, she wanted to be like her mother and she claimed that her mother was a witch. Um, and that also like led to to Sarah Good being executed. But the saddest part is like poor little Dorothy. She's four and a half years old. And you know, she's like claiming she got bitten by a snake and that her mom's a witch and she wanna be like a mom. She's four and a half years old. She gets in prison for eight months for being a witch. This four and a half year old is in prison for being a witch. Hello. <laughs> what? Like, yeah. what? What type of? What is that? So you're gonna have a four and a half year old like sitting for four yeah, for, for eight months? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, but I mean, so that's the that's the original three and three, right? So there's the original three accusers and the original three accused, right? So this this theory of okay why was it these women because that's one thing like in in this research that i first pointed out i said why is it these three women because when tichuba was the only one to to confess and she's the servant of paris i was like wait a sec hold, hold up a minute what's going on with the paris situation what's going on with the putnam situation what's going on with this so i started doing some digging and the accused girls there's like a list of of the 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 circle of girls that would like accuse people of bewitchment. All of them, like I w two or three of them, had relations to the Putnam family. Like two or three of them were in some which way related to Putnam. The other two or three of them were like basically just like calling out anybody like there's there's one that's named um Susanna Sheldon and then there's one that's named Elizabeth Booth those two I couldn't find like too much information on as to like where their their family came from but they basically just like came out of nowhere and like just jumped on the bandwagon with like you know accusing people but these other people are all in somehow related to Putnam or to Paris, or even one of them is the adopted daughter of um, William Griggs, the doctor that originally, you know, claimed bewitchment. It's just insane to see like that connection of these girls, right? And then the accused, all of the accused, there, there was like a recipe for, for you getting accused for witchcraft, right? You had to be like a little old bitty that like lived in the countryside that like really didn't like her neighbors um and that would war with the neighbors they would suspect them of witchcraft normally it was like the widows that lived out by themselves those were suspected of witchcraft you owned a very large farm and normally it was like the wife and the wife and the husband whatever which way you would be accused then or you would be accused if you ever said anything against um, Putnam or Paris or the church at all, or the witch trials in general. Like those were the three main recipes because before I did all this research, I always thought like, oh, pretty much everybody was just pointing the finger at everybody, right? Like it had to have been just mass hysteria. Everybody was scared of witches. So they said this person's a witch, that person's a witch. But when you really look into it at, who were the found guilty ones? There's over 200 accused, but the ones that were found guilty had somehow been related um, to, to to one of these, it had somehow been related to one of these factors. Like they had to have had a lot of land and a lot of money. They already were being suspected by their neighbors. 
um, or they had something to say against the trials or the church or Putnam or Paris. And I mean, I think that just further proves the theory that the Salem witch trials were all about who can we go after next? But the question is, is that, is that like what all of the Salem witch trials was? Or again, does it go back to, it just started off with these girls acting out and later on, you know, Paris and Putnam took over that, took over like this idea, like, oh, maybe this is how we can get these people out of the way and like take all of this money and, and get rid of all right. these unwanted individuals. I think the, when I say like the beginning, mm-hmm. I mean, um, when they were acting out to begin with before mm-hmm. the doctor said bewitchment was the cause. Oh, okay, like, yeah. Yeah. And when the accusation part is kind of murky because mm-hmm. I definitely think it depends mm-hmm. on like, did the girls just name these names off the top of their head because they seen these people the most or because they thought these were the people that would less likely be cared about or, or was it initially um suggested so if this was a neighbor then it could stand a reason that they seen her a lot whether or not they liked her i mean so i'm saying i think right there it could go either way Mm -hmm. so maybe they accused her because they seen her a lot and then her dad was like oh yeah let's push that issue because or they could have been suggested to the kids Mm -hmm. so I, i i think it could really go either way right there right. and that might have been the turning point point. and see that's the thing though too is that so i mentioned you know the accusers right and the accusers being these girls here's the thing the accusers weren't just the girls like the other ones had sway so the the accusers being like the quote-unquote bewitched girls so these were the girls when they um had this uh, trial, right? So just like anybody's probably seen back in like the history books or on some sort of documentary on the Salem witch trials, they would have like this courtroom and you would have like your magistrates, your judges and stuff in there. And then you would have the accused in there. Um, and you would also have the bewitched girls in there. Like whoever basically said, like, for instance, like Betty Paris, right? If she says Tichuba is the one that tormented her, then Tichuba would go in the courtroom, the magistrates and the judges would be in there, and then Betty Paris would be in there. And they would, like, do these tests where basically, like, the girls would start, like, writhing and fitting, and if the woman, like, laid a hand on them and they stopped, that was a sign that they were a witch. If there was, like, mimicry going on, so, like, the girls went and mimicked the motions of what the women were doing. That was one way to tell. Um, it's just, it, it's kind of crazy to me, first of all, like how they, how they said like people were witches. Um, but the actual accusers themselves, right? They, like Thomas Putnam would go and say, yeah, I'm pretty sure that person's a witch. And then Ann Putnam would be like, I'm bewitched by this person. Or like Reverend Paris would be like, I think, you know, Sarah Good's a witch. And then all of a sudden, you know, Betty Paris will be like, oh, I'm being bewitched by Betty Paris. You know, like stuff like that would happen. So with these girls that are, um, with these girls that are bewitching, it's or being bewitched, it's not just them pointing the finger at the women. It's also like all the other people surrounding them, like basically backing them up. You know, like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I totally, yeah, I've seen her, like being freaked out, you know, she's had nightmares for nights and nights and nights. And so they would all like conglomerate together, basically. What do you think, Sugary? Do you think? There's, there's been many cases even today mm-hmm. of, of, li- of witnesses being led. Mm-hmm. I, it was probably an unheard of thing back then. Like they mm-hmm. didn't, because it's just been recently that it's really been being cracked down on Mm -hmm. so i can definitely see where even if it wasn't as overt as that it was like oh well when did you see it happen Mm -hmm. was it over here oh well that's when you were at 
so and so is how do you know what i mean yeah. so even if it was like literally led to that point yeah yeah there was something else um yes. behind it yeah something how it was done mm -hmm. is i'm i'm not sure or even if um it did putnam and paris talk about it beforehand did they mm -hmm. plan did they get it? together and then say and, okay we're gonna go yeah out yeah or was it just like oh well he is an upstanding citizen and he's my friend so i'm gonna agree with him and go along with him do you mm -hmm. know what i mean like how mm -hmm. i mean that is up to question yeah and that's a that's the thing though is that for some reason now all of these people keep getting accused, right? And so the only one that was like kind of out of the blue, like you would never suspect that this person could be a witch type thing, was George Burroughs. Do you know George Burroughs? You remember him, the yeah. reverend? He, so he was the ex-reverend. Before Samuel Pierce took over as the reverend for, um, or the minister for Salem, George Burroughs was the minister for Salem. Now, Back in the day, in around the 1680s, he lived in Salem, he was the minister, and he knew Putnam. Now, he owed Putnam money, and eventually he left the town and never paid Putnam back. So he's out living his life somewhere else in a different town in Massachusetts, and he actually gets called back to Salem to go on trial for being a witch. And he was accused of being the ringleader of the witches, like he was like the head of the witches. He was the one, like, he was the main one consorting with the devil, and then he was leading this pack of women to do, like, vile things against the villagers of Salem. No, do you know what I wonder about that? Mm -hmm. Because literally word of mouth was the only way that things got around, mm -hmm. um, people going from area to area. Mm -hmm. I find it hard to believe that they went and got him just because this was going on here, but, mm -hmm. oh, by the way, this guy owes me money. Mm -hmm. I kind of wonder if he was talking shit. Like, oh, I don't believe that. That couldn't happen. That's mm -hmm. not true. I did and say then, that Burroughs' view on the Salem, like he did not believe in the Salem witch trials. I don't so know I how think talked that about was, was the but... leading cause mm -hmm. and the money that he owed was the excuse. Mm -hmm. I think... Don't you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think like one thing that's interesting to note as well is that, yes, he was the ex-minister, but not only did George Burroughs get charged and eventually executed as being as being a witch, or even actually the leader of the witches, even so, there's this lady named um, I'm gonna butcher it, Wilmot, I think is how you it's W I L M O T Wilmot, I think M Wilmot Red. Now it she was the mother-in-law, <laughs> I guess, but she <laughs> was she was the mother-in-law of um, George Burroughs, and even she um got uh got accused of being a witch even the mother-in-law of george burroughs was accused of being a witch and all she was known for was being like curt with her neighbors like she just really didn't like to talk to her neighbors you know she's kind of like a like a mean old granny and yeah even if she was uh she was accused and um executed as a witch so it felt like when you look at the list Is that before that him or his wife died that was around the same time that George Burroughs was like arrested and um, arrested and eventually executed. It was like right around in the same time frame that his mother in law so was also taken in. So do you think they used the mother in law because they couldn't get him to confess any other way? Like they thought. No, I that think that they took. I think that they probably took Wilmot Red in because she probably like swore up and down that he had nothing to do with it and was probably uh, trying to sway people. Uh, you know, like he used to be the minister of his town. He's not in league with the devil, you know, type stuff. Yeah. And yeah, and I think that that's probably why they took her in because she was probably a credible woman um, to to George Burroughs' case. And so they're like, oh, we got to get rid of her too. Um, now, looking through, now when I talk about this this list I have um, in front of me with the accused, these are the ones that were accused and executed except for Tichiba because we know that she just stayed in prison and was eventually anonymously, quote unquote, um, bailed out of jail. Now, looking through here, um, quite a few people were just, like I said before, they were either like 
little old ladies that didn't like their neighbors or it was like very wealthy families or was somebody that had something to say, right? Um, now, the interesting thing to note is that even one woman, her name, um, I'm going to butcher this one, but it's Ann Pudiator. Um, Ann Pudiator, she actually, I think she's just one of like the absolute most innocent victims of all. She was accused by Mary Warren. This was Mary Warren was one of the one of the 10 girls that was like the bewitched girls. Um, and nothing is really known about Anne Pudiator. Like she doesn't show up anywhere else except for in the Salem Witch Trials. They don't seem to have any connection whatsoever. And it's just like all of a sudden, because Mary Warren had proclaimed that the other girls the other like accusing girls, like the circle of the bewitched girls were all lying. Mary Warren said, all these other girls are lying, but I'm also bewitched. And then when every other girl turned against Mary Warren, that's when she just drags Ann Pudator into the process. It's like, well, she's a witch. She bewitched me. Like it just, it just felt like some of it was the girls. A little just, bit high schoolish. A little bit high schoolish. Or like they just literally found somebody that they didn't like. And they were like, yep. well, she's a witch. I'm not a witch. Like, she's a witch. Go kill her. Like, go kill me, you know, type thing. Now, I, I feel like we're digressing a little bit here from, from, from our main point of how this all ties back into, into this whole Paris Putnam thing because of the fact that, you know, we're, we're talking about the accused and how some of it was random and that kind of stuff. But I think that... A few of the accused solely lead to solely lead to the explanation of this this plot that's going on. One of them being John Willard, right? So John Willard, uh, he sold a lot of Salem land off to other merchants, right? So John Willard was a very wealthy man. He had a lot of land, um, and he was considered an outsider. He wasn't from Salem, like he just kind of lived in the area. He moved over there and like started buying land up. So John Willard, he was accused and executed because of the fact that he started selling off Salem land to like other merchants that were also outsiders of Salem. But the thing that I think put the nail in the coffin for him is that the sheriff of the town, Corwin, actually asked him to like help round up these witches, like help round up the, the people that were getting accused. And he said he wouldn't help him and he said that all of the girls that were accusing these other people of being witches should be hanged themselves and next thing you know he ends up arrested and executed for witchcraft this because other one obviously it was mm -hmm. a felony to disagree yep and uh, this other woman right here uh martha corey now she was the last woman to be known to be hanged um but she was actually um uh, Giles Corey, the man that got pressed to death, she was the wife of Giles Corey. Now, Giles Corey, the reason why he was pressed to death is because he would never admit to being a witch. And he was like, no, I'm a God-fearing man. I've never admitted to being a witch. But also, Giles Corey was a very, for lack of a better word, sketch character because of the fact that he had killed a man before. Um, so he was already, like, kind of on the fence. But um, especially, like, him being so just antsy and adamant and you know denying everything and he was very just making a mockery of it i think that's why he got pressed to death but his wife martha Corey, um now giles Corey actually at first said that his wife was a witch um and it was because of the fact that she was very controlling over him and she would like tell him not to go to these witch trial examinations and all this other stuff she actually, um, yeah, she got uh, accused for being a witch, and then she was just, she got hanged. Just, she was just, she was an innocent bystander. She just gets hanged because she was against the Salem witch trials, and she, she told her husband, like, nah, don't do it. So they got rid of her. Three sisters, Mary Easter, Rebecca Nurse, and Sarah Cloyce, they all had, like, large lots of land. They all did. And they were all like widows. Now, keep in mind, a lot of these people that got accused were older. Like they were like 60s, 70s, 80s years old, right? So they're older. Mary Easter, Rebecca Nurse, and Sarah Cloyce, they're all sisters. Every one of them hanged and executed. Every one of them. Why? Nobody really knows, except for the fact that they owned 
big pieces of property and they were old like that's that's that, that's about coincidence it. i think not <laughs> exactly for instance remember it this ties back into um this ties back into the land grab right like thinking about between between paris and putnam the land all of the land that was available this woman named mary parker she was a widow she lived completely by herself she lived like for 20 years as a widow she never remarried she owned like a big piece of land after her husband died and there's like not even really any records about her trial or like what went down but she got hanged and executed they know that so like literally there's no like there's no set in stone records on any like her trial her examination there's nothing so because without her nobody's there to own the land except for the town of salem um now just looking through like the rest of this pretty much everybody else that was accused um was kind of like an innocent bystander in a way for instance, like probably the most notable is John and Elizabeth Proctor. Um, they had a decent sized farm. Now they actually were the quote unquote masters of Mary Warren, one of the bewitched girls. Um, and John essentially was known for being like very rash. He, he had no filter whatsoever. Um, so he just spoke his mind all the time. And they were hanged and executed they owned a nice size piece of land they were wealthy um and because of mary warren who was their servant saying that you know they were tormenting her and they bewitched her they died um i mean it just the list goes on and on and on but for instance like bridget bishop she was just a, a little old lady that had been accused for many years of being a witch but it wasn't until the same witch trials that she actually was arrested and executed um elizabeth howe um she was accused by her neighbor's daughter uh hannah because she said that uh, she could feel like pricks um oh sorry excuse me so hannah basically said that she could feel like pricks on her skin and she and like pinches and she would get bruises and stuff and she would constantly blame elizabeth howe like the family just had i guess like a quarrel with each other she gets accused of being a witch, murdered, executed. There's nobody to take over her estate, so where does the land go? Back to Salem. Um, Susanna Martin, same thing with her. Just a little old lady on a piece of land. Everybody would constantly gossip about her. She's a sole owner to her piece of land. Where does it go when she gets executed to the town of Salem? It just goes on and on and on. Um, funnily enough, though, there was actually one person of high notoriety involved, um, aside from Reverend George Burroughs, and that was Sarah Wilds. She was actually married to a judge in Topsfield. So Topsfield was a town nearby Salem, um, and Topsfield and Salem were constantly in a land dispute. They were like, oh, no, this is my land. Oh, no, this is your land type thing, which Putnam was actually directly involved inside of this dispute because he started like trying to cut down trees by himself over, you know, in, in Topsfield. And they were like, no, this is our land. She gets accused and executed of being a witch. And it, like, isn't it insane? It's pretty much anybody that they did not want in the town of Salem, the unwanted or the ones in the way or the ones that had land that they could acquire all went missing or not all, sorry not all went missing but they all went uh, and got arrested and executed for so being when a witch. you say that the land reverted back to the town mm -hmm. of salem mm -hmm. quote unquote mm -hmm. like whose name were those deeds in so apparently what happened is whenever somebody was accused of being a witch they would go in and they would arrest the person for witchcraft, right? And so they would bring him in. So Sheriff Corrin, he would go in and he would arrest the people. He would like round up other people to help out. And then they would take over the land. So the land would be in the custody of Salem. Like it, it, it's kind of like, I guess it's just like seizing property. Like it's like, well, you didn't pay this. So now it's like, see, like for instance, like a house. Well, you didn't pay your mortgage but what i mean is by who benefits from that who whoever is in, char in charge of the town of salem i would imagine which knowing that paris was the minister of salem and in very good standing with the town well the wealthy elites of the town and putnam was like the wealthiest man in salem 
I mean, I would imagine that the land so could go between the two of them. So is that that's who benefited those two? I mean, aside from like a few of the other magistrates or clergymen, yeah. Mm. But that's why I think it was a ring. Like, I don't think it was just like they're obviously involved, Paris and Putnam. But I don't think it's yes. just them. I think there had to have been a couple of other like little magistrates Behind running the scene, around. Yeah, like Sheriff Corrin. Named. Like people like that, you know, it's just the names that are most notable in this in this case. But yeah, I mean, aside from that, it's just it continues on and on. And it, it was execution after execution after execution. Um, it pretty much anybody that got in the way um, of their plans was executed or at least arrested um, and put on trial. Now, this is where this this theory, because it could be coincidental, right? It, oh, she just she owned land and she was also a witch. You know, it could be coincidental, right? Here's the thing. Here's the kicker, right? Out of all of the girls that were, quote unquote, bewitched and that were in this circle of like the bewitched girls. Mary Warren, remember her, how I was talking about, like, she said the other yeah. girls were lying. So, Mary Warren, she proclaimed, you know, remember John Proctor went and he was very rash about how he spoke. So, like, he did not agree with the Salem Woods trials. He did not like the Salem Woods trials. So, I imagine that Mary Warren picked up on this and was like, yeah, those, all them girls, they're lying. They're, t- they're telling fibs. They're just doing this, whatever, whatever. So initially she would she would she would became the accuser of the girls. But as soon as she started speaking out of like against the girls, all the girls turned on her, right? So it was like immediately she was like, "Oh, I got to cover myself. Like I got to find a way to get out of this. I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get hanged as a witch." So she just started accusing everyone. Um she essentially like she accused the proctors she accused like several of these other people and it's not even known why like um and pewter pewdiator um I, there's no correlation between her and mary warren it's just like one of the uh, maybe she's like a neighbor or something like i don't know but she just kept on accusing 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 i think she accused like nine different people when she was accused herself of being a witch and that's the only thing that saved her from getting hanged So the icing on the cake is when Anne Putnam Jr., the third girl of the bewitched girls to proclaim that she was bewitched, later in life, writes a confession letter. Now, Anne Putnam, after the Salem Witch Trials, around 1699, both her parents died, the Putnams. So she was left to raise um, her siblings. She had like nine siblings. She was left to raise all of them by herself. She never married. She never had kids. At some point after this, she tries to join a church Um, and she goes in and she says, hey, I want to be a part of this church. And the minister at the time says, in order to join this church, you must confess your sins and they must be announced publicly. In her confession note, which I have right here, she says. I desire to be humbled before God, that sad and humbling providence that befell my father's family. In the year about 92, that I, then being in my childhood, should by such a providence of God be made an instrument for the accusing of several persons of a grievous crime, whereby their lives were taken away from them, whom now I have just grounds and good reason to believe they were innocents, and that it was a great delusion of Satan that deceived me in that sad time, whereby I justly fear I have been instrumental with others though ignorantly and unwittingly, to bring myself upon and this land the guilt of innocent blood, though what was said or done by me against any person, I can truly and uprightly say before God and man, I did it not out of anger, malice, or ill will to any person, for I had no such thing against one of them, but what I did was ignorantly being deluded by Satan." I mean, no matter how you look at it, that's a bullshit apology. Like either, either I didn't do anything wrong. It wasn't my fault because I didn't know what I was doing Mm -hmm. or whoever coerced me into doing it. I'm not going to say 
but I just want to just make a blanket apology so I can absolve myself. Keep in mind here that Anne Putnam, while maybe not the most notorious accuser, she was one of the most notorious accusers, while maybe not the most notorious, she herself accused no less than 19 people of witchcraft. Many of those died, like were executed. And she, in this statement, essentially says, I believe that I helped kill innocent people and that I did it ignorantly and unwittingly. Like she just basically says like, yeah, I might have like kind of sort of like thought that these people were witches and maybe somebody told me that they were witches, but I didn't really know. So I just said, yeah, they're witches. And now that I think about it, none of them were witches. Like, but I'm not at fault. Like I'm not the one that did it. Yeah. Like I had, I harbored no ill will and it was not done out of anger or malice. So what then? So what, what, so she basically, she says that she was ignorantly deluded by Satan. So you're telling me Satan told her to kill all these people? I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know about that one. Come on. That's what I mean. So Sugary, that, that, Wrapping up, what are, what are your final thoughts on this on this whole thing? I just think that there's too much information that we don't know, but mm-hmm. it's it's not as innocuous as they want us to think. And I so guess he, they being the founders and whoever wrote mm-hmm. the history. Mm-hmm. I mean, in looking at it, in my personal opinion, I think that the whole of the Salem Witch Trials started off as a, maybe some kids acting out. I think that's what started it. I think it was like some kids, they just didn't want to, you know, it's like, oh, I'm in love with the preacher's daughter, like some sort of song like that. Like, it's always the preacher's daughter that's up to no good type thing. I think that it started off with the kids acting out or acting up like they were just like not doing what was asked of them. And eventually, you know, this led to what's well, got to be bewitchment. There's absolutely nothing medically wrong with them. And then they realized, Oh, well, uh, we better say it's witches or we're going to get in a lot of trouble. And then the, then like Paris is probably thinking like, okay, yeah, like, let's go and make sure at least one of them confesses because it can't be my kid that's just lying about this whole thing. It makes me look like a fool to the town. And then from there, with everybody, like, believing that this could actually be a thing, Paris and Putnam were like, all right, who else can we put on the list? Who else is a witch in the town? Who else can we get something from? Who else do we need to get out of the way? And that's what that's what it was. I think that's the whole of the Salem Witch Trials. I think it started off with some kids acting up, playing like, you know, the boy who cried wolf. And then it turned into this. And I guarantee you, like, a lot of people, and then some people may say, well, that doesn't make sense because why wouldn't people, like, step up and, like, overthrow them and yada yada. Because of the fact that so many higher-up officials were involved, and, like, the fact, for instance, like, John Proctor, like, he just basically said, no, nah, I don't want any part of this. Like, I think they're, like, lying. Mary Warren, who came out and was saying, no, nah, I think they're lying. Like, that kind of stuff. They all were like, okay, well, then you're a witch. I mean, it's kind of like, what else choice do you have but to either, like, you know, turn your, your back on it and say okay, I'm not going to deal with this, whatever, and then possibly be persecuted as a witch or just simply go along with it and hope everything works out in your favor. Exactly. Yep. Hope for the best because you've seen what happens to those that disagree. Mm-hmm. Well, Sugar Ray, do you have any final thoughts on the subject? I think it would be so awesome if we could find a diary Mm -hmm. of the girls that were, that was written during that time. Mm -hmm. So we knew where their head was at. Why were they just acting out? I mean, obviously it's not going to say 
um, anything about the adults. Mm -hmm. But I, I say the kids because they're more apt to keep something like that. Yeah. Just to know more um, what they were thinking or why they were, if they were just misbehaving or that would be just for me, you know, better than life on Mars. Like, mm-hmm. just knowing that social intricacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you on there. Like, if we could just find out, like, more firsthand account information. Like, if there was, like, a diary. If there was... I mean, we have Ann Putnam's, um, like, personal confession uh, to the church. I uh, That she had to do to be... A standing member in the church. Yes, but I which wonder, after living a horrible life, she probably needed to do, or yeah. or was like how many people? Because to me, that's so mm-hmm. reminiscent of of that old adage where they're like, "I'm on my deathbed. I'm going to believe in God now. Uh-huh. Like I have no choice, and just in case I don't want to leave any stone unturned, that's what it feels like." Yeah, and I think that's true though, because I feel like. She probably was like, okay, well, you know, I got nobody else that's going to, like, do anything with me uh-huh. or do anything for me. So this is the best chance that I've got and uh-huh. and wrote it. And it I was think- worded in such a way to just mm-hmm. absolve her and anybody else. And see, what, what further it pushes just sounds that? sounds like bullshit. Yeah, and what further pushes this, though? For me is um, Abigail Williams. Now, Abigail Williams, I didn't mention her aftermath. Like, pretty much all of the other girls, except for Ann Putnam and Abigail Williams, had, you know, it easygoing type thing. Afterward, they got married or they had kids or whatever uh, and just continued with life. Abigail Williams, she at one point, the, after the Salem Witch Trials, fled the home. And fled Salem. It's stated that she possibly died around the age of 17, like somewhere in Massachusetts. They're not really sure of like what area. But it's basically said that she died somewhere in Massachusetts around the age of 17 after like becoming a prostitute in order to get money. Um, But my thing is this. If Ann Putnam Jr. writes this confession to the church... If Ann Putnam Jr. writes this confession to the church, Abigail William flees the home after the Salem Witch Trials ends. What other secrets are there? Like, what, what is it? Because we never, never knew, like, what Abigail Williams thought. We just know that she was not around after the Salem Witch Trials. She fled, like, she left. So, obviously, something happened there. Ann Putnam does this confession. What what really happened in between this pact of girls? And I think that I think it just plays back into it. I think it's honestly, it started off with kids playing around, and their fathers were like, "You're gonna also say that this person and that person and this person and that person um, are witches and yada yada." Like, and that's how it started. And they heard every day that it was a real thing. Mm-hmm. So, um, they being everyone else in that community. Mm-hmm. So it was so easy to get lulled into that, that it was a factual thing. This, this yeah. is happening. This, these people are evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's just kind of, it's like kind of crazy and it's kind of sad to when you fully investigate the Salem witch trials and you realize like what actually happened behind it it's kind of it's kind of just sad like it's kind of like well damn like and then they just got away with it well the majority of them just got away with it and this is where then you have the public service announcement kids Mm -hmm. this is why you don't take anybody's (laughs) comments at face value no matter how high they are Mm -hmm. in political power Mm -hmm. (laughs) sure (laughs) what 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 huh what huh what 
Uh-huh. Yeah, you can cut that out. Uh, <laughs> now I'm going to leave it in. <laughs> yeah, I think that just about wraps it up. I think that's the, the Salem witch trials in a nutshell. And I think that, I mean, that's that's the story of it. I don't think there's anything else that it could be. I don't think there was actual witches running around. Do I think somebody could have been a practitioner of magic? Sure. Do I think there could have been quote unquote witches or like old school versions of witches in town? Maybe, sure. But do I think it was this grand a scale and this crazy of no, no, no. This this it has a very much more logical sense when you start putting all of the pieces together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not that there wasn't um, anything metaphysical going on, Mm -hmm. but that this turned into uh, a witch hunt. Exactly. (laughs) All right. Well, I'm headed off then. Sugar, is there anybody, anything that you want to say to anybody? No. Nope. Wow. You don't want to say anything to anybody? Nope. Fuck them all. <laughs> well, all right. My name is Charlotte. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Dreadful Night podcast. I'm very excited to get started and uh, ventured into the podcast realm. I'm hoping to just bring uh, bring bigger and better things. Uh, I have quite quite a few things on the list that I want to cover, so we'll get into those. I plan on releasing these about once every week, so we'll see uh, we'll see how it turns out. And I'll see you guys next time. Have a great night.